morning, online church family, and welcome to Middleburg Baptist Church this morning. We thank you as usual, and we'll never stop thanking you for taking time out of your day to join us for worship this morning. Hey, today is Mother's Day, a day that we remember the moms that we had, we remember the women that were important in our lives, and whether you're a mother or whether you're uh, someone who leads a community of women or is a leader or a mentor to other girls, we just recognize you today and we spend this day lifting you up and we thank you. I thank you for my wife, Tina, and a mother that she was, and I thank you for my mom, Lottie, who is with Jesus in heaven. And I'm going to spend today uh, honoring uh, my wife, and I'm also going to spend today remembering the gift of memory that my Lord and Savior gives me for my mother, uh, who was so beautiful and so wonderful to me. So I hope that you uh, will enjoy the day. We're going to be staying in James today. We're going to be talking about our spiritual growth or how to deal with conflict. And so we thank uh, Pastor Dan for continuing to dig deep into the book of James. And so with that, this morning's scripture is from the book of James, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 and verses 7 through 8. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's the scripture for today. Enjoy the service, everyone. God bless you. Today is a unique day, and it's far bigger than we think, because there are many different kinds of mothers, and all are being honored today. For the mother who's chosen to stay at home while her children are little, may your patience be great and your influence even greater. For the single mom who never planned on doing this alone, may you be consistently strengthened by your Heavenly Father, and may you hear His voice singing over you. For the mother who strives to balance work outside the home with love inside the home, may you be given energy, validation, and hope as you make the leap from one world to another every day. For moms who had poor mothers themselves, but who now refuse to let that pattern repeat itself, may the godly legacy you've started be carried on for generations to come. For mothers with grown adult children, may today be filled with laughter and joy and may you experience deep satisfaction and fulfillment. For women who have no biological children of their own, but who mother younger women as mentors, may you understand your role as a calling from God and as a transformation of their hearts. Today is a unique day, so for all the mothers we mentioned, and even those we didn't, be blessed, be honored, be filled with joy. You are making the world a better place because you're filling it with a love that only a mom can give. Father to the fatherless, defender of the weak. Freedom for the prisoners, we sing. 
This is God in His holy place. This is God clothed in love and strength. Sing out, lift your voice and cry out, awesome is our strong God. Mighty is our God. Oh, yeah. Mighty Lord. Oh. With us in the wilderness faithful to provide every breath and every step that we see this is god in his holy place this is god clothed in your voice and cry awesome is our strong God mighty is our God oh sing out raise your hands and shout out awesome is our strong God mighty is our No higher, no, there is no greater, no, there is none stronger than our God. There is no higher, no, there is no greater, no, there is none stronger.
Well, good morning, and welcome to Middlework Baptist Church. Um, for those of moms out there, I just wanted to say happy Mother's Day, and it means so much that you're joining us this morning. I have had some amazing moms make an incredible impact in my life, uh, not only my own mom, but my, my wife has been just such an incredible impact on our children, and both my older sisters have had, since the passing of my mom a couple years ago, have had an indelible impact in my life, and so uh, just a, a huge shout out. You know, it's interesting about moms, especially brand new moms, and you may, you may know what I'm talking about on this. But once you find out you're pregnant, there's a lot of moms, at least my wife, for example, it's really common to, to go and look at the nutrition and vitamins, and we do all this reading uh, to figure out how I can be the best mom, how I can make sure that my child is going to be physically healthy right? How many of you have ever done that? In fact, when you go in and talk to your doctor, your doctor will say, well, uh, there's some foods that you're eating that are not going to be beneficial or helpful for the growth of your baby, and or if you're uh, going through the, uh, the nursing, you know, there's certain foods that your, your baby is not going to like, and, you know, and, and so there's some things that sometimes moms will have to cut out of their diet so that they are helpful to their, their children. And there's some other things that often a doctor or will read about through our research that, you know, add this to your diet for all the nutrition you know, vitamins and, and, you know, moms will be reading labels. I'm not sure what this is. Is this going to, you know, hinder the growth of my child or stunt the growth? And there are all of these real focuses to be able to just kind of determine whether or not am I going to stunt or hinder the growth of my child. And, and that's what most, you know, good moms do. They kind of really look at what can I do to give my child the most uh, impactful, healthy diet possible. And, you know, what's interesting is God kind of does the same thing with us. In our spiritual lives, there's some things that we do or add to our lives that will stunt our spiritual growth. And this morning, James is going to talk to us about some things in our spiritual lives that will help uh, promote growth, and he's also going to talk about some things this morning that will stunt your spiritual growth. My encouragement for you this morning is to have an open mindset and that you would be inviting the Holy Spirit to reveal in your own life as, as Pastor Dad has been doing all this week, as I've been kind of studying this passage uh, in preparation for our sermon this morning, to be able to evaluate in my own life, are there some things, uh, spiritually speaking, that are stunting my growth, or are there some things that I can be doing to help my spiritual life and growth increase and become more healthy? Well, there's some things in uh, the book of James <clears throat> I've talked about uh, in these five chapters, these little divine one-liners, and last week we talked about that words have a very powerful impact. They, they can either promote life or they can promote death, and it was just, I got some great feedback from some folks that really attempted to try and provide and give life uh, through their words to, to others. And then the week before that, in, uh, uh, we looked about the importance of actions that speak louder than words. James said in James 2.17, uh, you know, if our uh, faith, um, if it's not accompanied by actions or works, that our faith is dead. 
an amazing, you know, uh, prioritization that we need to have actions in our faith uh, to demonstrate that our faith is alive and kicking. In week number two, we looked at eliminating our bias during this series. In fact, James said, if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers in chapter 2, verse 9. And then last, or week number one, we started off, and James said, let perseverance finish its work so that you and I will be mature and complete, not lacking anything not lacking anything. And that really is our goal for this entire series, is that we would become mature, that we would identify our mm, things that are tripping us up in our faith, that we would identify that and then embrace and overcome that so that we can be mature in our faith, complete, not lacking anything. So this morning we're going to cover James chapter 4, and we are going to be looking at how to avoid stunting our spiritual growth. And the very first thing he talks about is conflict. Okay, if, if you're watching there live on Facebook this morning, you know, let us know where you're watching from. We always love to see that. And, you know, again, anybody out there have conflict in your life and uh, that you are dealing with? Most of us are, especially with this pandemic or this plague, how, whatever word you want to use. We have been hanging around each other a lot. And God has used this past year in my life, I'm sure, I think probably in your life too, to be able to adjust and work through the conflict that many of us have experienced inside our homes because we've been spending so much time together. But the first point in, in, your, uh, in your outline, and you can look on Facebook, we have uh, a post there that has the outline if you're uh, following us there, but what uh, causes fights and quarrels among you? James chapter 4 verse 1, he says, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You don't have because you do not ask God, and when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So the first thing we want to look at is let's identify in order to identify how our, our, our spiritual growth and our spiritual life is being stunted, the first thing we want to do is identify the source or the root of the conflict that's within. Now, if you're like me, there's lots of times in your life where you, you want to look at the person you're having the conflict with, and you want to do this. Okay, if you would do this, 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 and this, then I won't have conflict with you. But what James is, you know, really encouraging us to look at is, no, 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 let's hold up the mirror and let's take an inventory look at within. So let's break these verses apart. The first one, in chapter, chapter 4, verse 1, he said, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within? Within. Well, no, 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 I'm sorry, James. I don't want to have to deal with looking at the inside. I just want to deal with the other person. And James is saying, no, 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 no. It's important that we take a hard look within. And so the first thing that I think he kind of identifies when he says the battle within, the, the, these desires, these can be insecurities, These can be things that, another way of saying it is the things that I'm afraid of or things that are, that make me fearful. What makes you fearful? What makes you afraid? And, you know, how many times in life have we had no control over the outcome or our circumstances and we just embrace this fear within? It's very common. And then it creates an insecurity. And ultimately, he wants us to be trusting him throughout the difficult, painful thing that we're experiencing. But what happens a lot of times is the fear within us is growing, and we are not relying on God. And so this first thing I want to ask you is, what are you afraid of? What 
That's just a great question. What are you afraid of? What is the outcome that you are afraid of? What are you insecure about that could occur that's creating this conflict within that you are battling with others about? That's the first thing in, in, in verse 1. In verse 2, he said you desire, so you, there's things that you want to see happen. You have a desire, but you don't have, so you kill. Now, it's not literal, but when James, uh, Jesus said that you know hatred is the same as murder, it, that's kind of what we're saying here, or what, uh, what James is saying here. So you kill, you covet, you know, in other words, covetousness is a sin, one of the first, you know, Ten Commandments there. You covet, but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you don't ask God. So here's the, the, the second part here is unmet desires. And one of the things that I just want to present to each of us is, when a friend, a spouse, a family member, your employer, um, whatever is creating the conflict within, and you are saying they are not meeting my desires, then we need to kind of take a step back and say, well, is this a godly desire? And in other words, is this rooted in selfishness within or is this an okay desire that I have? And that's something that you're going to have to really pray about and seek the Lord about. It's something that you're going to have to take some inventory and, and really ask the Holy Spirit to reveal inside your own heart. I mean, so if you have an unmet desire, is it, is it an actual need it, or is it selfishness? But yet, when we pressure and insist and demand that that happens, then sometimes we are becoming selfish and perhaps even self-centered. Uh, I think about spouses, and they'll argue and fight over certain things, and sometimes they're just not talking uh, very clearly about how they can kind of uh, differentiate, is this a need or is this a want? Am I placing my preferences over yours? And sometimes those are you know, based in selfishness, and that's what James is talking about. You desire, but you don't have. You can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Fight. And then he says, you don't have because you don't ask God. You know, one of the things that I really want to encourage each of us is when we talk about asking God, we're talking about our prayer life. We started a series in the very beginning of, uh, of 2021 on prayer. And, and, the, and the key hopeful walk away on all of that is when you have a preference or a desire or there's something going on in your life, God wants us to talk to him about it. He wants us to bring that before him. He wants us to ask him. And so even with unmet desires that we would ask him. And I, I had someone the other day tell me, you know, what was interesting is they're probably in their 60s now. But they said about, you know, 10 years ago, they, they stopped arguing and fighting with their spouse and just took it to God in the sense that they just focused on praying. And so what they would do is they'd go in their proverbial prayer closet uh, during their, their time with God alone, and then they would bring these requests to God about, God, this is a, a thing within me that I, I, I want to see happen in my spouse or you know, my sibling or whoever or something at work, and I'm just going to pray. And this individual was just attaching all these answered prayers because the requests were being made known to God. And he's saying here, you don't have some of you because you're not even asking God. So make sure that we are praying and asking God um, for our needs that are not being fulfilled. And then he says in verse 3, when you ask, so when you're praying, many of you, uh, you're not receiving. Oh boy, look at what he says. Because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now, James, uh, we see here about the whole spending on your pleasures. He's talking about wealth, and now he's talking about, you know, finances. And, I, I mean, how many times have we jokingly said, if I just won the lottery, I would help everyone out, and, uh, but yet 
you get a raise and we go and we just kind of focus on our own self and we spend it on our own own self. It's important that when we ask that we are praying not our own motives, but that God's will would be done. You know, Jesus said, we pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So we want to pray God's will. And we want to make sure that our prayers are not just based in selfishness. Our key for this section is that conflict is always going to identifying an internal weakness or something, uh, it's not like you're bad, it's just something that needs to grow. Um, Conflict, and when we take the time to examine ourselves within, it will identify things within us, not the other person, not the situation, but things within us that need to grow and become more mature so that we are complete, not lacking anything. Conflict, therefore, is an opportunity, not just an obstacle. Or, a lot of times in conflict, uh, the body language, or the tone of voice we use, or um, our verbal tone will oftentimes exasperate, and instead of just a little small fire, all of a sudden, our words, our tone, our body language within the conflict, and now we're fighting just the other person. We're not even addressing or dealing with the root key issue in the first place. In Proverbs, I'm reminded reminded that a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And so how many times uh, as we are developing and uh, dealing with... um, uh, the way we strategize on quarrels and fights that occur within us, that we would also take a look at our body language, our tone, the choice of words we use, that they could be more neutral and more edifying versus um, adding fuel to the fire. Everyone should be slow to speak, James said, uh, quick to hear and slow to become angry. My main question here is what is the root of the conflict? identify the source of the conflict within myself. The second thing is that we want to identify our worldly priorities. We want to identify our worldly priorities because uh, once we do that, we will avoid stunting our spiritual growth. He says in verse 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. That is a very bold statement. Being a friend of the world is, is at the same time becoming or being an enemy with God. Well, let's unpack this a little bit. When James is talking about friendship with the world, um, he's talking about worldliness, or carnality, as Paul would talk about, you know, can somebody be a carnal Christian or a worldly Christian? Uh, worldly is relating uh, to or having devotion to this world that we live in. In other words, are you devoted to the world and the way things are in this world, or are you devoted to Almighty God? Worldliness has a condition of prioritizing the affairs of this world and neglecting spiritual, godly things. So it's not only prioritizing the things that are in this world, but it's neglecting or pushing away the things that make us godly and our spiritual disciplines. Anything good, you know, anything good, food, your job, a relationship, a hobby, all things that are fine in moderation, but anything good can become a worldly obsession. You know, workaholism. God wants us to work with all of our heart, but He doesn't want us to become a workaholic. Uh, James expands on it here in verse 5. Do you think, Scripture says without reason, that God is jealous and longs for the Spirit He has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That's why scripture said, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. You see, God is jealous. In other words, God wants 
to be in the number one spot in your life. God doesn't want your spouse, your kids, your job, your, your money, your possessions. He doesn't want anything else to be in the number one spot. The number one priority in your life must always be God. And when God isn't there, he becomes very jealous. And he's going to address that individually in your life as he has in mine. What spiritual disciplines am I neglecting? What spiritual disciplines am I neglecting? Or what worldly things am I pursuing and have in the first place of my life that I need to get out of there and make sure that these are in the first slot and the first priority. When we don't do that, we will be stunting our spiritual growth. The third thing is that James is also going to give us a little to-do quiz uh, that we need to kind of evaluate within ourselves. There was a time when my wife used to, uh, I don't know, get these magazine like Women's Day or something, and there would be, you know, little quizzes. Uh, Is your man like this? Or uh, it would talk about uh, things that you prefer. And there was a little quiz, and you could say yes, no, yes, no, maybe, or, you know, or whatever. Well, James is going to give us kind of one of those things right here. In verse 7, he says, Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and God will come near to you. Wash your hands and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter into mourning, your joy into gloom. And then he says again, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Well, let's look at our little quiz here. Am I submitting to God or do I have characteristics of rebellion, disobedience, and disagreement with others? What what characterizes my life? This first one is my life characterized as submission to God or rebellion and disobedience? The second thing is about resisting the devil. Am I resisting our spiritual enemy, the devil, or am I conforming? Am I in compliance with our spiritual enemy? Am I going along with? You can't do both. It's either you know, kind of one or the other in the specific area. Am I drawing near to God is the third one. Or am I avoiding God? Am I pushing God away? Am I retreating from God? Am I trying to hide from God? Or am I drawing near? Again, we want to make sure that we are drawing near to God. Uh, The fourth question here in our little quiz that James gives us is, am I cleansing? Am I confessing my sins to God? Am I purifying my heart? What a theme. All throughout the Old Testament, in our Wednesday night uh, small group, we've just been looking at uh, the establishment of Moses with the temple and how important uh, the cleansing was for the priests and anyone who went into the courtyard. Am I cleansing, confessing myself, and purifying my heart? Or am I polluting my heart? Am I corrupting? Am I, am I soiling my heart? Am I... Is my heart dirty? Am I not cleansing my heart? And then the last question is, am I humble? Am I humble? Versus egotistical, being rude, pretentious, arrogant, proud. What would characterize me for others? You know, Rick Warren says that humility is not thinking less of yourself. Actually, humility is thinking of yourself less. And the great thing about all this in verse 10 is that humble yourselves and God will lift you up. So our key here is that we want to examine ourselves to see that we are in the truth and then to act accordingly. There may be some of us this morning that we need to confess that there is something on the list that we just read that, yeah, that's characterizing my life right now. It's becoming a pattern of choice or a pattern characteristic or a description of who I am as a person, I need to get that out of my life. And I need to really focus on the Lord and make sure that I'm either submitting, resisting the devil, drawing near to God, cleansing, uh, purifying my heart, and really focusing on uh, elevating God 
and so that I am humble. We want to examine ourselves to see that we are in the truth. When we do that, we will avoid stunting our spiritual growth. Uh, Number four is that uh, James brings up that uh, he wants us not to slander. And so in your outline, it's to avoid slander and judgmentalism toward others. Verse 11, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Uh, This word slander, the the definition is an action or crime of making a false spoken statement damaging to a person's reputation. Have you ever slandered someone? Have you ever said something knowing that it is going to make that person look bad? It is going to make their reputation uh, look not accurate and make them look really bad. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but you're sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy you. But who are you or who do you think you are to judge your neighbor? You see, what happens when we judge others, it's as if we are sitting in the judge's seat there in the courtroom. And when you are sitting in the judge's seat, what you say goes. The judge has control. I have stood before a judge in traffic court. I don't feel like telling you that story because it's a little embarrassing. Maybe I'll tell it to you sometime, but yes, I'm standing there before the judge. I pleaded guilty and he threw the little traffic court book at me. Uh, He was in control. I was not. And that's the way it was set up and designed. You know, when we are slandering others and when we're judging others, what we're doing is we are taking control. And we're not letting God do what God needs to do, but we are, we, it's like we are sitting as the judge over them. And it, it always comes back to burn us on the other end, especially when we're slandering and we're trying to ruin somebody's reputation, and it's a lie. There's times that we will communicate something, and it comes back, and then, you know, the people closest to us and other will look at that and say, you know what? You're a liar. (laughs) How can I even trust you? Listen, you don't need to slander anyone. You don't need to judge anyone. Let God do that. God will deal with people. If there's unjust people out there, and there's people out there that are not living for God and doing terrible, evil things, God will take care of them. You don't need to be the judge over them. Let God do that. Which leads to our next point, is that God wants us to seek in all things. He wants us to seek His will each and every day. Look at verse 13. Listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we'll go to this city or that city, ah, let's spend a year there. We'll carry on business and we'll make some money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. Look at what he says. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Wow. You know, if you rewind back to 2020 in January and you were to sit down in executive board meeting for a restaurant or a company and they would put their five-year plan out, their 10-year plan or their 20-year plan, only to know that in about 35 days from then, our country would be shut down in many ways economically. You know, and and, and this is kind of what James is saying. You, You don't know what's coming. You don't know what's just around the corner. In fact, a lot of us were excited that it looks like the you know, pandemic or the, the plague that we've been experiencing this last year, it looks like it's like beginning to lower and hopefully we're on the tail end of this thing. I think we're way beyond the middle, but we're not at the end yet, but we're getting there, middle to the end somewhere, right? But you know, there's it could be another one that pops up in you know, eight months from now. We we don't know. God knows. And that's what James is saying, is that you make all these, like, plans, and you're boasting, and 
you think you got it all figured out, and then the Lord steps in and says, oh yeah, no. And there's a war. There's you know, a bankruptcy. There's something that happens that just kind of takes you from out of left field. You know, premarital counseling, there's times that I'll be sitting down with a couple and there's no way to know what's going to come around the corner. I, I remember one couple that, uh, one of the very first weddings I did, and, and then she ended up getting cancer just within about a year and a half and then passing away. Just this be- wonderful young couple. They had no idea. And when they first got married, they had such big plans and such big dreams, and we don't know what's coming up. And, and, this is, and, and this is what James is saying. Seek the Lord each and every day. If you had a certain goal or plan in your life and God said no and changed it and said, this is actually what I want you to do in your life, you got to do it. You've got to respond to that for two reasons. One, if you ignore that and pursue what you want to do over what God's will is for your life, you're going to find yourself very frustrated and not experiencing the inner joy and peace and fulfillment and purpose for your life. Instead, if you just go ahead and get on that train and go wherever God tells you to go, you will experience an incredible amount of joy, whatever happens down that road. It is so important that in all things we seek God daily. If you don't, you are going to stunt your spiritual growth. The next thing is that God is going to, or the final thing, God is going to remove the gray areas in our life. He's going to remove the gray areas in our life with this very last verse I'm going to share. And what he's going to say is, do the good or it's going to be credited as sin. James, whoa. Let's look at the verse. Verse 17. If anyone knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. You guys, I can break into the Greek on this, and guess what it says? If you know that you're supposed to do something good, and you don't do it, it's sin. So a lot of us, especially in the Bible, will be looking at, oh, well, like the Ten Commandments. Or like last week I said, you know, the, in, in the Proverbs, it, it, it said, you know, six things the Lord hates, seven, you know. And, and like, or when Paul says the, the deeds of the flesh are this. And there's a big list of sinful things that we look at and we're like, oh, okay, yeah, 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 that, that, that's a sin. But now when I look at this and... Okay, so if God wants me or is telling me within, my, my spirit, my knower, right? it's kind of hard to explain. It's not your conscience, but you just know that God's leading you to do something good. To offer a kind word to somebody who's really struggling. And if you don't do that, then that would be a sin. If, if God was telling you to serve your neighbor in some specific way, and you didn't do it, that would be a sin. We had a big windstorm last weekend, and my neighbor had a 30-foot tree and about 15 feet up. You know, it was a, you know the trunk was that big, and it, it broke right about 15 feet up. And it wasn't an audible voice, but I knew that the Spirit of God was telling me, go over there and help him cut up that tree. And so I did. And if I hadn't have done that, then that would have been a sin because I knew that God was telling me to do something good for somebody else. What is it that God is telling you to do that he wants you to do for him? Real quick, last week, uh, one of the challenges I gave uh, at, uh, during the sermon last week about um, you know our words can either uh, promote death or life. And so uh, my neighbor was uh, having a 60th birthday party And uh, somebody that I've known ever since we've lived there for over 20 years, Uh, he's a a man of God and has, you know, served God in missions and everyone knows he's a believer. But he also has a lot of friends who are not believers that aren't Christians. And I just love that about him as well. Well, 
They throw him a 60th birthday party, and I'm over there. And guess what the Spirit of the living God told me to do? In relation to last week's sermon, I kind of talked about creating this little hot seat. Well, I went over to his wife, and I said, hey, do you mind if I just kind of uh, do something here where I kind of put him in a chair and I, I kind of have everybody say a few words about him. And she said, oh, that'd be perfect. And so I did that. And one of the coolest moments is there's probably about 20 of us there and it, it went on for maybe a half hour. One of the coolest moments was I saw a son over there. He's like 24. He's not a huge like public speaker, you know, kind of person and doesn't like to draw a lot of attention to himself. I said, hey, is there one word you would describe about your dad? That something that's really encouraging or whatever. And he not only shared one thing or one word, he actually spoke for like two minutes, which was just huge. And his dad's sitting there and he's going like this under his sunglasses. I was responding to the spirit of the living God telling me, I want you to initiate this hot seat for this individual. And I was like, yeah, of course. Now here's what would have happened. If I'd have said no to that, um, it was interesting because the next day I saw his wife out, you know, outside. We were getting ready to drive off or whatever. And hey, Pastor Dan, Pastor Dan, I got a couple calls this morning, and people told me that that was the most meaningful birthday party they've ever been to, and just was so glad and appreciated me stepping up and doing that. And I said, well, you know what? I mean, you're welcome. You're welcome for the part I had in it, but I'm just praising God that God gave me the idea to go ahead and do that. All right, there's three things I want you to do this morning at the conclusion this week. Number one, I want you to take James's little magazine quiz and look at uh, the spiritual you know, disciplines and what kind of virtues that you have in your life that we talked about. So just kind of look through that list and then just kind of say, does, you know, which, which side characterizes me, or is there one particular thing that I can emphasize and work on this week? Second thing, in regard to your conflict, second thing I want you to do, in regard to your conflict, recognize the root cause. My friends, we've got to get to the root cause. We've got to get away from your tone and your body language and you know, you chose a, a, a word that you shouldn't have chose in our conversation and it made the argument even worse. We got to get beyond that and we got to get to the root. What is the root issue within you that is helping or contributing or causing the conflict within? What is it you want? And then communicate that and to the person or individual or your employer or whoever and just let them know that this is what I want. And how can we get there? What, what, what can we do? And then that's a good time for them to be able to express back, hey, you're being selfish, or that's just not something that's going to happen right now. So now we've got to make some other plans and work around it. Which leads into our third thing that I want you to do. I want each of us to respond to the good that God is telling you to do this week. I believe that from this morning's message in James chapter 4, verse 17, that anything that God wants you to do that is good, and if you don't do it, it's sin. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to test that, that inkling, test that leading that you are experiencing or feeling. I, wa- I want you to respond to it. And I want to know and see if God is not only in it, but he's actually speaking to you and directing your path. And then you would be fulfilling that in all things, I'm seeking God each and every day. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this time this morning in avoiding the spiritual growth, the stunting of our spiritual growth. We want to... Be mature, complete, not lacking anything. And so I pray that these scriptures would, that your Holy Spirit would be speaking to us on things that we need to put on and put off in our life. I pray for each and every person who's listening to my voice right now that this morning they would say, yes, I want to be your man. I want to be your woman, God. I want to honor you 
in, in my entire life. I want to be complete, not lacking anything. I want to make sure that I am not stunting my spiritual growth. And I want to honor you in my obedience and surrender. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, that's today's service, and we thank you so much again for joining us. We hope that you are well. Know that we're praying for you. Keep in touch with us. Keep tuning in on 9 o'clock every Sunday morning. We'll be here for the near future. So next week, we're going to conclude the book of James. We're going to talk about what it means to deal with the storms of life and what James has to say to us about that. Have a great day, everybody. Again, happy Mother's Day to all. Go be the church in your community. I mean it. Go be the church. Show them the light of Christ. Have a great day.